you turn with me to page 814, page 814 in the Book of Common Prayer. So we're going to open in prayer, but by doing that, I want to show you that in the Book of Common Prayer, there are, um, there in the back, there are theories of prayers for our use. And they are prayers that are set out according to um, uh, situations of life. Their prayers for creation, for peace, for uh, the church, for the people, for our enemies, for conflicts, for national life, for colleges and schools, and um, uh, young people, and uh, our our use of nature, and for families and for people who are traveling, for people who are grieving and for birthdays and for the victims of addiction and for guidance and for protection and for in the morning and for in the evening. And you get my point. <laughs> um, uh, this is um, important, I think, because um, what I run into often is is um, this probably is more so with those who uh, have been in the Episcopal tradition a long time. <laughs> but um, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to pray. Um, how do I pray? And those are really great questions. And um, I occasionally teach a class on prayer. Um, but I think one of the um, uh, blessings, and then sometimes I think it can be a curse of the Anglican tradition, is that is that we have a Book of Common Prayer, and the title tells us exactly what it is: Common Prayer, prayer for the life that we all live and the common situations of life. And often we don't know how to pray, and we don't know what to say, and that's okay, um, because uh, we can rely on one another in those moments. And it's not uncommon that if one is seeking guidance, they open up the Book of Common Prayer and they pray uh, a prayer for guidance. It may not include all of the feelings that they're feeling at the moment, but it can sum up many of the feelings that they're feeling at the moment. Um, the mark of a successful prayer, you might say, which is a really difficult thing to say anyway, but the mark of successful prayer, a successful prayer, is not that you thought about it in the moment, <laughs> right? Or extemporaneous, as we sometimes say. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> sometimes we are flooded with exactly what we want to say and exactly what we're feeling. And sometimes we are not, and it's okay. So we have um, in, the, in the Book of Common Prayer, and then if you continue on to there's Grace for Neil, page 835, page 834, prayers before receiving communion and after receiving communion. And then as it moves on, there are thanksgivings. Thanksgivings, a general thanksgiving, a litany of thanksgiving, thanksgiving for the church, for all the departed, for our nation, for the social order, for the earth, for family, for restoration of health for the diversity of races and cultures. All those are available to us. Someone asked one of the things we might cover is how can we learn to, learn to understand the Book of Common Prayer as a book of personal devotion? Well, this is a part of it. This is, this is a part of it. 
So let us pray for the church, the unity of the church today on page 818. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice and whatever else may hinder us from godly union and concord. That as there is but one body and one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, so we may be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify thee through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Well, welcome. Great to see you here, um, those online and uh, in the room. For those of you online, um, I can't figure out how to turn the volume up on the TV. So I can, if you have a question, scream. <laughs> it's up enough that I can hear that you're, you're, you're looking for, or raise your hand. And the folks out here will see you raising your hand and, um, and we'll know we'll know what to do. Um, all right, well, we're continuing on in our study of uh, the church and the history of the church and how the Episcopal Church works. One of the questions that was asked in our, what are our hopes and expectations for this class is, is how, does, how does this branch of the church work, right? Um, some of us just grab, hey, Carla, just grab some chairs from back there and pull them up, yeah. Welcome, welcome. Um, how does this branch of the Episcopal Church work? So one of the dynamics that you keep on hearing me say is that the Episcopal Church is a is a Protestant church. That's not a question. <laughs> it's a it's a Protestant church in the life of Christianity. And its history, though, as we touched upon last week, is unique enough that the way in which its Protestant culture developed is different from the Protestant culture of the other major Protestant traditions in Christianity, Presbyterian and, and Methodist and Baptist um, and Reformed. And um, those, those are the main ones. That that you might you might mention yeah so um so there's a difference so and the scale you might say this is a false scale but sometimes you just do things in order to to give um markers of things right so the scale in the christian world is from here in the roman catholic tradition of of liturgy of order of the way in which the church operates to a kind of what we what is termed in the Protestant world kind of free church, right? A, a free which can encompass a lot of different denominational uh, organizations, if you will, free Baptist or just free church or um, any church that where the congreg that is based in a congregational style where this congregation is an independent level of congregation, if you will, right? So that's a kind of uh, very uh, um, crude, if you will, kind of analysis, if you will. The way in which the Anglican church developed in its Protestantism has it, you know, kind of in the, mi in the middle, depending on who you are, and in some places in the world, and in some of the Anglican churches around the world, they're a little bit more over here. And in some, they're a little bit more over here. <laughs> right? And you can see this in individual Episcopal congregations. Some Episcopal congregations, they're, the way in which they worship has a lot more similarities to a Roman Catholic uh, uh, worship style, and you can come to an, some Episcopal churches, and the way in which they worship is much more 
uh, like a free church kind of stuff. Now, the same is true when it comes to how does the church operate? How does the church work, if you will? And I think I mentioned this in the first class. I'm going to bring it up again, and it's kind of a, a guide for us to understand. Over here in the Roman Catholic tradition, we one of the ways to name this tradition is a kind of a, a magisterial tradition that the authority of the church um, that comes from the top, uh, clearly identified, and is sent out to the people, right? Um, again, I'm I'm not. This is crude way of saying this. I'm not uh, uh, suggesting anything negative here, right? It's just that in this system, um, if you have a question about what does the church believe about X, there is an answer. <laughs> there is a big book, the Catechism of the Church, the clergy of the Church have fought that through, they have written down an answer, and they have sent it out to the people. That is the answer to that question, <laughs> right? Now, on the ground, Roman Catholic believers have all types of ways they navigate these things, but I'm just saying that the way the system is organized is magisterial. There is a, a, the clergy of the church, the theologians of the church study these questions, they pray about these questions, and they come to conclusions on these questions according to their beliefs and doctrines, and they write down the answer to these questions. What does the church believe about um, uh, uh, dogs when they die? What does the church believe about? No, really. I mean, these are in, there's an answer in the book for, for, for this, right? So that's that type of system. Then you have on the extreme over here, you have the kind of free church system, which often, this is crude too, but often you could you could name this as a biblical type of, you know, the Bible says, you know, type of, you know, we read it in the Bible and that's what it says and, and, and that's the authority, right? The question here is authority. Where is the authority of the church, right? So that's kind of uh, one way of looking at, again, this is crude, but you might see it that way. Then you have a whole group of uh, Christian denominations that are understood to be what they call confessional, confessional churches, right? And these are many of the Protestant traditions, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran. They understand themselves as confessional churches because there was at a time in which um, it, we just take uh, the Lutheran tradition, for example, they just claimed you know, a number of writings of Martin Luther as the, the beliefs of the church, the confession of the church, and, and made it their confession. So in theory, when you become a Lutheran, you are signing on to the Martin Luther's writings and, and his confession about, about the church. Same thing in the Presbyterian tradition, where there's the Westminster Confession, and and that has that's the kind of standard of the Presbyterian tradition. And when you become a Presbyterian, you theoretically are signing on to that confession, and that's the tradition that's that's kind of guiding guiding you. So the question becomes, what is the Episcopal tradition? <laughs> And so it's a little bit, it's a little bit more um, um, nuanced, you might say. And it's different in different branches of the Anglican Church, right? So for example, in the Church of England, when you are ordained, you do sign on to a, a group of beliefs. Um, I actually think they did away with needing to sign on to this, but anyway. There's a little bit more of a uh, you know structure there, if you will. And the Episcopal Church in the United States and in the Church of England, Anglicans in general, though, we say have always been guided. The authority has always been in the worship. So that's why, again, this Book of Common Prayer is so important. In other words, the way you pray is the way you believe. 
that our prayer states who we are and what we believe. This is becoming strained in the Anglican tradition as we move more and more into the modern uh, world. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a, still a good way to, to see where the authority of the Episcopal Church uh, wants, uh, has wanted it to be. <laughs> um, let's put it that way. And you can call this a liturgical tradition. So you have a magisterial tradition, you have a confessional tradition, you have a, a free church or biblical tradition, and then you have a liturgical tradition. Ours. Yeah. What is the Catholic church considered? Magisterial. Oh, magisterial. That would be that one. Yeah. Yeah. Margaret. Um, the fourth of magisterial, as in Greek and yeah. is it seems magisterial. It, it, but it's also Protestant. Yeah. Yeah, they do not consider themselves Protestants. So. <laughs> they would be horribly offended by that. But you're right. It is a magisterial system. And I should have mentioned it's different than the Roman like, tradition. And it is, we have a lot of similarity to the Orthodox in, in how our authority is carried, but not quite the same. They still have the Orthodox Christian, which is, you know, nearly half of all Christians around the world, by the way. Um, they have a magisterial tradition where the clergy and bishops do make a lot of decisions. But what they would want to point out is it is a college of bishops in prayer making this decision. There's no one bishop like the Pope telling them and making final decisions, right? So that's a very, again, crude um, thing to way of, way of understanding all of these traditions, but just to give us a little bit of a, a guideline. So the one way you can understand the Episcopal Church is as a liturgical tradition that if you wanna know what we mean by baptism, go to the service of baptism, read through it, look at the, scripture readings that are appointed for baptism, those set out what we might mean by baptism. Look at the prayers that are set out in the liturgy for baptism. They add to what we believe about baptism um, and, and so on and so forth. Right? That would be a way to see what is authoritative for the Episcopal Church. That is why when I am ordained at all Episcopal priests have in there uh, are required to abide by the rubrics. Rubrics is uh, a, a word for instruction. So if you just turn to page, let's turn to page 355, for example. Uh, so all the little italicized instructions in the book, they used to be in red, where the word rubric comes from, instruction in red, right? I can be brought up on charges for not following the instructions in the Book of Common Prayer. That's one of the main claims that I can be charged with for violating my ordination if I do not follow the instructions of the Book of Common Prayer as they are printed out. <laughs> and so that, again, that gives you a little bit more understanding of why the Book of Common Prayer is, is um, in the Methodist Church, it would be the Book of Order, for example, right? But our order is in the liturgy. There's not a separate Book of Order that lays out kind of the things, the discipline of the church. It's in the Book of Common Prayer. And then I think I mentioned in our first class, maybe I did, that, um, for example, one of the best ways to understand this is that when uh, back uh, many years ago now in the 70s, um, the decision to allow uh, female uh, ordination, women to be ordained, 
of course, there was so much discussion and so much theology done and so much, so much, so much. But what the what had to be voted on was just changing the italicizing the pronoun he in the ordination service. That's all that needed to be done to allow women to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. Do you see what I mean? It comes down to the way we pray is the way we believe. Now, again, this is getting strained in our modern era, and uh, but I that could be a long conversation. So um, I just want to um, uh, uh, leave you um, with that. Now, let's go on, though, because I know that you want to know, at least some of you want it or others want to be reminded. Um, so then how the question becomes, so who, 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 how are decisions made and who makes decisions in the life of, life of the Episcopal Church? Question so far? I'm talking past, yeah. It's a quick one. They just, these instructions, the ones that say the celebrant may say, right. is that optional then? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, it's the, it would be the celebrant says. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Explain the scale. Yeah. Where would you place training? Well, uh, well, uh, in, in terms of a, a liturgical tradition, all Episcopal churches are liturgical tradition. Uh, in terms of worship style, Trinity is kind of a, what we call now a broad church. <laughs> You know, we're kind of right in the middle. You'll, I mean, if you grew up in a Roman Catholic tradition, you feel very comfortable in at, at Trinity Church, and and yet we we don't have a confessional booth in the back, and we're not saying the rosary before church begins, and things like things like that, which you can find in many Episcopal churches. Not all, but some Episcopal churches will have confessional booths and yes, and and scheduled confession singing of the rosary and the blessed benediction of, of showing the, the consecrated Eucharist and so on and so forth. All practices that are perfectly acceptable in the life of the Episcopal Church, and you will find congregations that do that. Mm -hmm. That would be high church, right? Yep, low church would be congregations uh, many congregations in the Episcopal Church were what now you would call low church, but then was just the Episcopal Church 30 or 50 years ago. Um, at the main service, there wouldn't be communion. It would be kind of once a month, um, that type of um, way of, and uh, there would never, there would rarely be um, uh, some of the Eucharistic vestments that are worn and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll do worship and and the the um uh an Emmanuel act, if you will, and how that that um, plays out. Any other questions before I dive into to how the decisions get made? Yeah, Peter. It's the how these decisions are made with lay and ordained working. Yes, well, that's where I'm going. Okay. Um, so our church is, the title of our church is the Episcopal Church. Now, um, the word Episcopal in English comes from the Greek episkopos, which means overseer, overseer. And that's the word that you see in the scripture. I'm not going to open up the scripture right now, um, but in the places of the scripture that speak of loosely speak of how the church is operating. Uh, these are in the pastoral epistles, Timothy, um, and so on and so forth, how the church is kind of operating. We hear it said that so-and-so is the overseer of the community, right? Um, and in Greek, that's episkopos, right? And so obviously this church is led by bishops because <laughs> that's what that word translates to into uh, English, bishop, right? 
So we are a, a church led by bishops, but unlike the Roman Catholic tradition, where the bishop, again, I'm, I'm being crude here, but nevertheless, the bishop really hold, is the seat of, maybe the word all is too much, but the seat of all authority, the bishop and really does make the final decisions in the life of the diocese. In the Episcopal Church, we have bishops who work together with lay people. They do have authority. There's some aspects of our life together that only they make the decisions about. Things like who can be, or not even then, but um, you know, only a bishop can ordain somebody. The bishop does lead the diocese, and there's a the bishop only a bishop can do confirmation. Um, only a bishop can ordain um, folks. Um, but the diocese is operated with lay people and the bishop kind of working together. So, for example, if somebody wanted to be ordained, our our canons or laws of the church doesn't allow the bishop to just say, oh, I like you, I'm going to ordain you. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole process that includes lay people making an evaluation of an individual, making a recommendation to the bishop, um, so on and so forth. And then the bishop, after all that happens, the bishop ordains. But the bishop isn't allowed to ordain if all of the lay people say, we don't believe this people should be ordained. Now, the, the opposite, however, if all the lay people say, we think this person should be ordained, they can't force a bishop to ordain someone. That's, I'm only giving you that example. It's a little bit of how that dynamic imbalance works in the um, way in which uh, the Episcopal Church operates. So last week, we talked about the diocese and uh, the structure of the Episcopal Church. I mentioned that um, you know the the all of Christianity, most of Christianity, at least before the Reformation, was its authority was organized geographically. That in this certain geographical area, these church leaders were the leaders of the churches in this area, and that has again, outside of the what we call the free church, Protestant free church tradition, that has held true for, for almost all of Christianity, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Orthodox tradition, uh, the Episcopal and Anglican traditions, Lutherans, and Presbyterians, Methodists, so on and so forth. All of their kind of authority, if you will, is organized geographically. This area of North Carolina is led by this group of Presbyterian leaders and so on in the, the synods in the Lutheran church and the conferences in the Methodist church and we have diocese, right? Diocese is led by a bishop and then there's a certain number of congregations in them and um, each congregation has a lead clergy person usually called a rector, that's me, and then associated clergy person, that would be Amy is an assistant or, or an associate clergy person. And um, we all work together. I talked a little bit about that um, last week. There are three dioceses in, in our state, Episcopal diocese in our state. We're in the Diocese of Western North Carolina, which goes all the way out to Hickory, all the way up to the Virginia border, all the way down to um, the South Carolina border. It does not include Rock Hill. I mean, um, um, Gastonia, but it does include, well, it does include Gastonia, but it doesn't include Charlotte. So it's gets close to Charlotte, but, but doesn't. It does include Denver, North Carolina, which is on this side of Lake Norman, but it doesn't include Mooresville, which is on the other side of Lake Norman. So that's just a general. We have one bishop, Bishop Jose McLaughlin. He's been our bishop for about five years. Um, and our diocesan offices are over on Chunsco Road um, in, a, in an office uh, area, um, if you will. Oh, so he's in Asheville? He's in Asheville. Asheville is the seat 
of the diocese. So, yeah, Nashville is the center of the diocese. Asheville is the largest city in our diocese. Um, Eighty percent of all members of this diocese live in Asheville and Hendersonville. Um, but there are congregations throughout, from Murphy to um, up in Boone, and and um, uh, what's the name of that town right on the border with Virginia? Little town, anyway. Um, uh, up and down uh, this area, right? Um, Trinity Church, this church is the oldest church in Buncombe County. The only churches that are older in our diocese, just by a hair, are uh, Holy Cross in Valley Cruces and St. John's in Flat Rock and St. Francis in Rutherford. And yeah. The oldest church or the oldest Episcopal church? Oldest Episcopal church, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So we are the oldest Episcopal church in Buncombe County. This church was founded in 1849 by um, um, Miss um, Patton. Um, her husband was, they were involved in the Presbyterian church across the street. And she said, I am being an, uh, a Presbyterian. <laughs> And she said, you need to give this property for an Episcopal church. <laughs> and he gave this property for an Episcopal church. And she started this church. And, and her husband, Thomas, yep. And he came along. And, and the window uh, in the back of the church is in his memory. Um, so that's a little bit of uh, that outline. There, this is the third building on this site. Uh, and if you, when you go down to Tooten Hall, there's a little alcove going out into the chapel courtyard, and you can see the three buildings that have been on this site. The second building burned to the ground in 1910, and this building was completed in 1913. <clears throat> um, so it's the, the oldest Episcopal church in this area. Uh, currently, it's the largest Episcopal church in our diocese. Um, and uh, it was for it's been the, the place where most of the bishops have been consecrated and elected. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think all the bishops have been elected here at the diocesan convention here. Yeah. Um, the building that burned, it wasn't the church, right? No, it was the church. Oh, yeah. it was the church. Yeah. yeah. The choir was practicing one Wednesday night, and all of a sudden they smelled smoke, you know, those old gas furnaces, and there it went. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the church was reconstructed in what year? 1913. 1913. Okay, gotcha. Above us was designed by um, Cram Good Goodhue, which is a very well known architectural feast. And um, Many churches throughout the country were designed by the same same folks. Bill. Did you say it moved about from one to the in Carolina and did they ever do that? Only if they're hired by a different diocese or a different a bit that could lead their post and go lead a congregation if they wanted to. Um, or do some other type of parachurch ministry if they wanted to. Yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stuart. Uh, uh, why then chose this mm -hmm. as the oh, good question. Yeah, <laughs> good question. So the question was why was the the uh, other um, the Episcopal Church in Biltmore Village all told? Um, um, he's asking why is that that titled the cathedral of our diocese. Good question. Long history. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis. Um, George Vanderbilt. Well, no, it has nothing to do with George Vanderbilt. He was dead by the time this happened. Oh, okay. No, this is very, which is part of the point. This is only about, what, 20 years old, Ed? 25 years? Uh, maybe 20, 30. 30 years, only 30 years ago, was also designated as a cathedral of the of the diocese. All Souls was built in the late 1800s. This church was already established for quite a long time. Um, and mostly as a 
in the initial intention was kind of private chapel, if you will, for the, for the Vanderbilt family. Um, it quickly grew um, um, to more than more than that. Um, but that's why in this, this congregation really served mostly as kind of what uh, colloquial is known as the mother church of the diocese all along, even though that's designated at the cathedral. Okay, I want to say this in a, a generous way. We had a bishop back in that about 30 years ago who wanted a cathedral no matter what. <laughs> you don't have to have a cathedral in a diocese, Episcopal church. You don't have to have one. As a matter of fact, in the Roman Catholic Church, you have, to have a cathedral and the bishop's seat, cathedra, the seat that they sit in, cathedra, is only in one place in the cathedral. The way the Episcopal Church in the United States was set up originally was not based on cathedrals. That's why there is a bishop's chair in every single congregation. You will notice if you look at Trinity's altar to the left, you'll see a big chair with a big, uh, goes way up high, and there's somewhere on there, if you go up and look and feel free to do it, there's a bishop's hat carved into it. And that's why nobody sits in it unless the bishop is here. here. The idea being that the bishop's location is wherever he is or she is, and that's where the bishop is to be. But some Episcopal churches just couldn't take it. They wanted to be more, you know, more and more or authoritarian or and have authority, some diocese. And so many dioceses in the early 1900s started saying, we're going to make a cathedral, right? And so they make cathedrals. And then we had a bishop about 30 years ago who fell into this, right? I think this is mostly kind of 1950s, you know, corporate America type of organization energy, right? <laughs> And um, we need to have a cathedral. We have to have a cathedral. And a cathedral, by the way, is in its pure form, is led by the bishop. The bishop is the rector, right? So our wonderful bishop at that point asked the vestry of this church, I want you to be the cathedral. <laughs> and the vestry, this is, I don't know, somebody knows a lot more history of this than I do, but, but I'm going to say this anyway. I, um, um, our, best, our vestry was concerned that they'd no longer be able to choose their rector. <laughs> somebody else would be doing it. <laughs> and so while they were amenable, that negotiation did not go th that way. <laughs> and so the bishop said, well, I'm just going to find a church that will do it. And All Souls said yes. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Um, and I went to All Souls for um, Christmas Eve service. And um, anyway, and I can't remember her name, but she was the right reverend. And then when I attended. Was... Uh -huh. right. Oh, I could have sworn I said right reverend. No? <laughs> no. Okay. So she was very reverend. <laughs> I'll go into titles at some point. Oh, okay. Well, that's that was my question because it was a cathedral. Is yeah. that why she was the right reverend? But you're saying she wasn't the right reverend. The, the, a cathedral, the person who leads the cathedral on behalf of the bishop has a specific title, a dean, and a title. Yeah, and it's a say dean. Yeah. And yes, and I went to um Cathedral Church of the Advent in Birmingham, Alabama. And yes, it was, it, he was the dean. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's out in the, he goes, his schedule takes him to a, a different congregation everywhere in the diocese every day. Hey, Scott. Uh, yeah. He preaches when he comes. I heard someone. Hey Scott, it's Beth. Yeah, back during the um, the cathedral choosing, there was, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't there a lot of talk about Saint Matthias? Yeah, there was some talk about making Saint Matthias the cathedral too, but um, the parking was too difficult. But the parking was too difficult in Billmore Village. Oh, okay. Um, did I answer your question? He preaches wherever he goes. 
wherever he goes. Whenever the bishop is present, the bishop's in charge, even when he comes here. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. About the bishop's power. If a bishop becomes, excuse me, if a bishop becomes problematic, what can the priest and congregations do about it? Yeah, so if the bishop is not there, that's not where he hangs out every Sunday. Right. Then why is it a cathedral? What's the what's the point? That's a long conversation. Oh, that's a good answer. I'm have that with you. Um, I'm curious. But yeah, it, a cathedral can serve as like a a gathering place for for a diocese, and um, often there. I think what what often the, why this this becomes a conversation in our diocese is because. Uh, all souls uh, frequently can't handle the size of a large diocesan gathering. So we end up meeting here anyway. Um, and so, but it, uh, a, a cathedral is usually the largest structure in a diocese or often a very large structure. And it can serve as like a gathering place for the for all the different congregations. And, and that does happen um, at all souls. Um, but not all the time. All Scott, time. the largest things happen here. Scott, yeah. how do I tell the bishop when I see him? I mean, how do you tell a the bishop? Clamshell hat. Yeah. <laughs> so you, they have the hat and they wear a purple shirt instead of a black shirt. Yeah. Scott. Um. Scott, there's one. A quick question here. Could let me ask you. Could what's that? Could, can you hear me? Yes. Could a bishop? Oh, I know the history of our congregation was quite opposed to be losing its parish status and becoming cathedral. Could the bishop have said, no, you will be the cathedral? No, he couldn't have demanded it, no. Okay, no. thank you. Well, he was asking could the bishop have just told us we had to be the cathedral. No. Question back here, Tina. She was around then. <laughs> she probably knows more than me. <laughs> Clinched our decision as a parish. Yeah. Uh, against the cathedral is the, the Sunday that the bishop came to preach. <laughs> oh. Was preaching about our really wanting to be a cathedral. But called us, the, the, said that we would be the servant parish. Oh. Of the diocese. Of the <laughs> we would be servant. what parish? Servant. All right. Oh, servant. Well, let me thank you, Tina. I want to get to at least something in the next uh, ten, the next ten minutes. Um, so, um, what I want to get to is how do larger decisions get made for the life of the Episcopal Church, like uh, allowing women to be ordained and those types of decisions. So, um, when when the Episcopal Church uh, was established after the Revolution. Um, many of the folks who were involved in writing the Constitution of the United States and setting up the system of the United States of, of having a, a Senate and a Congress and uh, this kind of bicameral kind of way of making decisions were also leaders in the Episcopal Church, right? So that's what we have every three years. The Episcopal Church gets together in what's called a general convention. Yeah, a general convention. And at this general convention, every diocese sends representatives. And they say they send ordained representatives, priests and deacons, and then they send lay representatives as well. And each one of these representatives goes to two legislative bodies that meet during the general convention. One is called the House of Bishops, and one is called the House of Deputies. And this is for the lay 
persons, and this is for the ordained <laughs> persons. And at this general convention, decisions are debated, questions are debated, a budget is set for the entire Episcopal Church. There's been, in between the three years, there's often been lots of committees that meet about questions in the church, such as should women be ordained or not. Those committees often um, have done lots of theological study and theological work, um, lots of meetings, public meetings, public um, conversation, and um, um, a decision will come to be made and any decision that gets passed has to be approved by both of these bodies and they have to agree just like in the in the uh, government right so if all the bishops want something but the lay people say no then it doesn't happen if all the lay people want something but a lay, the lay and ordained, sorry, sorry, I made the mistake here. These are bishops, these are lay and ordained. So these, this body is lay people, priests, and deacons. If all the bishops want something to happen, but the deputies say no, then it doesn't happen, right? And then on top of that, if all the bishops say yes, the deputies can say uh, somebody in this group can say, we want to vote by orders. In other words, we want all the lay people to vote together and then all the ordained people to vote together. And then those two have to agree within this group before this whole group can agree. What's the point here? The point is to uh, set out before you that, that the bishops have a major role in leading the church but they're not doing it all by themselves. So we are an Episcopal church. We are led by bishops. Um, they do have authority, but they don't have the same type of authority in a magisterial system. In a magisterial system, they would be up here, <laughs> right? The bishops and the lay people and the priests and deacons may partake in in the conversations about decisions, but the group of bishops by, makes the final decision. That's not true in our tradition. The bishops and the lay and ordained folks have to come to agreement here. Um, and so that's where you see the Episcopal Church's uh, way in which it operates, if you will. Um, um, yes, we're Protestant, but yes, we have the, the ordained persons have a space for leadership in the life of the church, if you will. Does that make sense? Am I making sense here? I'm not asking you to agree, but I'm saying, am I, am I explaining it well? <laughs> right. Sometimes another person has to say, yeah, please not say no. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so um, excuse me. I, if you mean, I'm going back to the new prayer book in the 70s. Yeah. The, the folks that were against the book were sort of general. This is crude, too. Said so nobody ever told us about this. You know, we didn't have any city. But the truth is, as you just described, no major decision is made without the big voice from the land. The clergy and then the bishop. So, yes. it, it, you know, you just pay attention and you can be a. That is true. That is true. The, the only thing that might also be true is that often the lay people who care about this stuff and go to this stuff are not reflective of the people who are sitting upstairs on Sunday morning. <laughs> okay, let me get into. Just in this last few minutes, the question is, how long do bishops serve for? Good question. So in the Episcopal Church, there are, well, in, in uh, this was true before the Reformation, right? Um, 
and it's true in some Protestant traditions in certain ways, right? So some of these titles are used throughout the Protestant tradition. But there are three orders of ministry, right? bishop, priest, and deacon. Each one of these individuals, it's, it's an ordination. You're ordained to the order. And in our tradition, this would be an example of where we lean this way a little bit. Um, these orders are for life. You are ordained for life. Our theological understanding of ordination is that it is a sacramental act. It is a holy moment. It is something that happens um, by the power of God and the people consenting and can't be taken away ever. The person may be barred from serving for something they've done, but their ordination is not taken away, right? You will hear some of these were some of these uh, orders mentioned and used in other traditions differently, right? So I don't really in the Baptist tradition, right? A, a deacon is a leader of the church, isn't that right? But but that's a term of service, and at a certain point, they're no longer a deacon, right? So they're deacon for life. Deacon. They're elected to serve for a certain number of years. Certain number of years. Okay, great. Thank you. The Puritan Church, both elders and deacons are ordained, ruling elders, deacons, and they are that for life. They didn't have a term. Only have a term of service. In the Methodist Church, the term bishop is used, but it <clears throat> only have a term of service. So you're only a bishop for your term of service, and then you're no longer a bishop once your term is over. So, but in the Roman Catholic tradition, these are for life as well. In the Orthodox tradition, these are for life as well. Um, that answer that question. Yeah. Okay. But there's not a term limit, like for the bishop. There's not a term limit. No, there is not. For retirement age. There is a retirement age with the um. Yeah, there is a retirement age. It's supposedly driven by the pension fund. <laughs> It's not driven by, um, yeah, much of anything else. <laughs> so 72, at 72, we're all supposed to retire. Um, yeah, we can go on and continue to work, but we're supposed to give up our post. Yeah. Can the, can the bishop I'm not working until 72. <laughs> just, 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 so you, just so you know. Yes. The question is, can the bishop decide I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah, just like I can decide I don't want to do this anymore, right? Um, so yes, they can, they can. Uh -huh. And there are some occasions where bishops will leave their diocesan post and go be a bishop in a different diocese, get elected to be a bishop in a different diocese, because it's prettier. Like um, the former bishop of Kansas went to be the bishop of New York. <laughs> which is much bigger and much richer and much more <laughs> interesting, so to say, to be. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry if you're from Kansas. You can't stop. What other questions in this one? This comes under the heading of, you know, how do decisions get, get made? So, um, um, uh, at the same time that I say this, many of the decisions that are made at this general convention, well, this is a little bit where things are getting strained. For, for most of the history of the Episcopal Church, this general convention did not meet with a major intention of making decisions um, that that would have to go out to the diocese and now all dioceses would have to operate differently and and so on and so forth um but but um uh in in recent decades it, it's growing more and more that the resolutions of general convention are like you shall not you may but you shall and um there's quite a bit of debate on on whether or not that's how effective that is and how 
how good that is and so on and so forth. But yeah. Having watched movies on how they elect a Pope. Yes. They can't agree on anything. They pick some unknown vanilla personality <laughs> the church. I'm, I'm hopeful that this system is a little bit better at that. Hope springs <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> churches delegates are chosen uh, for years years and years ago I was part of a very small parish and I was asked to be a delegate yeah. part of the group that went to <laughs> vote on uh, Bishop Johnson Bishop Johnson. We interviewed him. Okay. I was part of that process. It was very interesting, but at the same time, because I was a small parish, I felt like yeah, we didn't really, you know, there were big churches, right? Lots of power, and, right? You know, so is there some of that hierarchy amongst the lay people in convention? Um, in this diocese, it doesn't matter what size your congregation is; you get the same number of delegates that go to the diocesan convention. Okay, it's not true in every diocese. Now, um, my friend, former diocese of North Carolina, a congregation like ours would have like six delegates go to convention, where a small congregation would have two, for okay. example. But in this diocese, every congregation gets the same number of mm -hmm. delegates that go to. Everybody gets two. Everybody gets two. Yeah. Quickly, last question. Yeah. Does follow No, not at all. In the Church of England, um, guess who gets to say who bishops are? The queen. queen. Yes. <laughs> or the king now, pardon me. Uh, right. Now, in reality, a committee of the church um, uh, appoints, uh, says these folks are eligible to be bishops and recommends to uh, the king who should be appointed uh, to be a bishop. Um, and that committee probably does include lay people as well. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we're at the end of our rope for today. I think I've kind of concluded, if I, if I, I think I've kind of concluded the like, how does the church operate? We're going to open up the book next week, turn to the Book of Common Prayers, Eucharist page, and we're going to start looking at the liturgy and the Eucharist and, you know, what does the Episcopal Church believe about communion? How does that happen? Why do we do X? Why do we do Y? Um, what does Z mean? Um, when somebody says X, what does that mean? Um, so on and so forth. So we'll be able to do that um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, no. <laughs> Sweet. Go and